All right, looks like we're live. Perfect. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is William Randall, and I'm a campus recruiter with Mercer. Um, today, I have with me several colleagues that support our wealth and investments business, as well as other campus recruiters. Um, I have Michaela Seward. If you want to wave, Michaela, say hello. Uh, Michaela covers uh, central recruiting efforts in the U.S., and we also have Ozma Khan. Uh, she supports campus recruitment efforts on the West Coast. And again, my name is William, and I support the East Coast. So essentially, uh, sometimes we do receive questions as it relates to applications. Just know that um, you can send a message to those recruiters, um, either myself or Michaela, if you have specific questions as it relates to one of those uh, geographical areas. Um, the purpose of today's call is to provide insight into Mercer's wealth and investments business and also give you a closer look into what our colleagues do in, in their day-to-day -day work. Um, we really hope that you find value in the material that's shared and, and again, it's, it's um, an opportunity for you to engage as well as ask questions. Um, following the presentation today, um, the recruiting team will be reaching out to all registered participants and we'll be following up with additional resources. Uh, we'll provide the link to today's session. So if you want to go back and reference the material, you'll have that. And we'll also be officially uh, sending information as it relates to additional job postings as they're available. So just note that there will be follow up after today's conversation. And again, we hope that you found value in the material that's shared by the team. Um, so we can jump right into introductions. I believe that's going to be Jim. Hi, guys. My name's Jim Barrett. And so I'm on the investment consulting side. Um, graduated from University of Rochester in 2015, majored in financial economics. Actually started with um, William, an investment advisory firm in Chicago. We were eventually acquired by Mercer in November of 2018 transferred to the New York office at that time. And um, earlier this year, I was promoted to senior associate. And within the investment consulting space, I mainly focus on endowment and foundation clients. Thanks, Jim. I'm David Hessdorfer. Uh, I'm out of the Washington, D.C. office. A little bit about my background. I graduated from Vanderbilt University back in 2014. Um, I was a double major in mathematics and economics. Um, I started full-time at Mercer in the Atlanta office as a defined benefit um, for pension plan actuary. Um, I'm still taking actuarial exams, um, but I've transitioned my work more so to defined contribution, so think like 401k plan. Um, and I also do have some pure investment clients, um, so similar to the work that uh, Jim does. Um, I've kind of floated around. I've gone from the Atlanta office to the Washington DC office. And um, recently, earlier this year, I was made a people manager. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexa Marshall. Uh, so in December of 2016, I graduated from Allegheny College. Um, I was a math major and an economics minor. Uh, then I started full time at Mercer right after that um, as a defined benefit analyst. So I'm solely working on the defined benefits of pension plans. Um, I work in the Pittsburgh office. Uh, in 2019, I was promoted to an associate. And then in 2020, I became a credentialed actuary uh, when I received my ASA. And now I'm currently working on trying to get my FSA. So still working through that rigorous exam process. Hey, I'm Danny. Um, I graduated from University of California, Santa Barbara in 2014. I was an actuarial science major there. Uh, went into college not even knowing what that was, heard about it, went through the major. And, uh, you know, a month after graduation, I ended up full time at Mercer. So I'm also full time as a defined benefits analyst, um, at least when I started out. And a couple of, I think maybe a year or two after I started, we introduced the dual hatter program where some of the DB folks could get involved with some investments work. So I picked up a couple of clients, started working a little bit in that and haven't really expanded too much on the investment side. I've still kept my workload small there. So I'm still mainly focused on the DB side. Um, in 2015, I joined our rising professionals network, which is a business resource group at Mercer. Um, so we do 
you know, networking, put on events for learning, training, things like that. And at that, that same year, I started doing some of the college recruiting. A um, couple of years later, I was promoted to associate. And just last year, I became a people manager and I now manage two of the analysts on my team. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just give you the brief introduction to Marsh and McLennan Companies and Mercer, and then we'll dive a little bit deeper into what wealth does, um, which is what we're all here to talk about. So MMC is a big global professional services firm. Um, we basically work with other companies on their own benefits, areas of risk, strategy, human capital, things like that. And under the MMC umbrella, there are four companies. So that's Marsh, Guy Carpenter, Mercer, and Oliver Wyman. Um, so, you know, we're all here from Mercer, so I'm not even going to get too much into those other ones, but we'll go ahead and get straight into Mercer and talk about us. Um, what we do is consulting for career and talent, investments, retirement, and health benefits. So these are all mainly looking at uh, compensation and benefits plans for companies, employees, and consulting for them, um, you know, looking at the risks involved with that, helping design plans and, and implement those and administer those and take care of all the, the bits and pieces along the way that goes along with that. So under Mercer, um, when I started out, there were four lines of business, and that's because retirement and investments were two separate businesses. And a couple of years after that, we combined into one wealth line of business. So that just makes sense for us to be able to consult on both of those sides together since they do go hand in hand and really make us uh, more well-rounded as consultants. Um, also under Mercer, our health and career, uh, you'll probably hear a little bit more about them if you join those virtual meetings and get those introductions. But here, uh, we're going to go ahead and focus on wealth. So within wealth, we serve over 56, or I'm sorry, we have over 5,600 colleagues serving over 10,000 clients in over 50 countries. So we're all over the globe. And because we're such a big organization, we have so many people and we serve so many companies, you know, that's really where you hear about where our expertise comes from. We have so many people, so many resources to pull from, and so many experts in these fields that we work in. So I'll go ahead and uh, give you a quick intro to what we do as DB and DC uh, consultants and kind of tell you, give you an introduction of what retirement plans we work on, what that looks like. And then later on, um, Alexa, David, and Jim will go into more details about the type of work that we do. So just at a high level, um, here are a few different types of retirement plans that we consult on. Uh, the first is a defined benefit pension plan. Um, this you'll, you've probably heard a lot about in the news as, you know, these are the plans that companies had a long time ago and now they're starting to get rid of them and go over to DC plans. So I'll kind of explain why that's happening, but also explain why, you know, as we go into the details, why there's still so much work for us to do on both of those sides, even though you're hearing that in the news. Um, so a DB plan, the employer sponsors the benefits for the employees to have a retirement benefit when they retire. And this is generally based on pay and service that the employee accrues while they're working. And then upon retirement, there's you know, a formula that, where we calculate what that benefit amount is gonna be and that's usually payable monthly for their lifetime. Um, there's a lot of unknowns in calculating a defined benefit liability. And some of these unknowns are how long that employee is gonna work, at what point they're gonna decide to leave the company, at what point they're gonna decide to retire, and then how long they're gonna receive that benefit until they eventually die. Um, and because there's so many unknowns, it could be really difficult to calculate the liability and expense that a company takes on for sponsoring these benefits. So we have to use assumptions to calculate those amounts. 
And um, since this is an employer sponsored benefit, it goes on to their, the company's balance sheet is reflected that way. Uh, an OPEB plan can be thought of similarly to a defined benefit plan, except instead of providing a retirement income, uh, the company provides welfare benefits such as disability, um, post-retirement medical benefits and life insurance benefits. And because this is an employer sponsored benefit, the employer is putting in the money to, for the employees to take advantage of. This also is reflected on their balance sheets. Um, the defined contribution plan is a lot different than those first two because even though the employer might sponsor it and they put contributions into the plan, uh, the benefit that the employee receives mainly depends on an account and how that account balance grows over time through the contributions and through investments, investment returns between the time of the first contributions up until retirement. And the benefit that that employee receives at retirement depends on that account balance and basically what they think they need to to live on monthly from retirement up until they die. So they handle more of that risk, whereas a defined benefit plan, the risk is on the employer to make the contributions, worry about the investment returns, and make sure that they have enough money to pay out those benefits upon retirement up until their employee's death. So comparing a little bit more, going into a deeper dive of uh, DB versus DC, and comparing and contrasting some of those features. If you could go to the next slide. Thank you. So when, as I mentioned already, when we calculate a defined benefit, uh, a pension benefit, we use the employee's pay and service over their time at the company. There's a formula, usually some percentage multiplied by uh, maybe their final pay or the, the final three years of pay averaged over those three years multiplied by their years of service at the company. Um, so for that benefit, it's really great if you have employees that um, stick around, or it, it's good for them at least, because they're gonna have a, a bigger benefit. If they stick around for a long time, they have long service, because um, that's gonna go into calculating a bigger benefit for them. Uh, the contributions come almost always from the employer on a defined benefit plan. Um, and because it favors people who stick around longer, it, it's actually not a, a portable benefit. This is usually used as a tool to attract and retain employees, people that you want to stick around for a long time. And it's better off you know, for the employee if they do stick around and accumulate a bigger benefit. Um, as I mentioned, in that situation, the risk is completely on the employer. They have to make the contributions and worry about what the investment returns look like, making sure that there's enough money in their trust to be able to pay those benefits um, up until the very last employee is, has paid their last benefit. Um, for a defined contribution, in contrast to defined benefit, the benefit that the employee receives, as I mentioned, is based on that account balance. So employees may put in contributions towards that account balance. So think of a 401k plan. Just about all of you have probably at least heard of a 401k plan. The employee might make contributions to that and then the employer will either match that or just make a free contribution of whatever percentage. Um, so that goes into an account. That account grows with interest over time based on what the market is doing. It's invested and, um, and that money grows up until that person is ready to retire and receive that benefit. And in that case, the risk is really on the employee to decide how much do I need to take out every year or every month and how long do I need this money to last for? How long do I think I'm gonna be alive and receiving this benefit? Um, so, and also with this benefit, uh, something that's nice that employees and employers can both uh, both look at as, as a positive thing is that the benefit is portable. So say uh, an employee wants to leave this company and go to the next company. For a defined benefit plan, that benefit doesn't transfer over. Whatever they've accrued in that first company is there 
and um, that's not gonna go with them to the next company. For a DC plan or a 401k plan, if that employee decides to go somewhere else, they could go ahead and bring that 401k with them over. They'll still have the full account balance that they've accrued up until that point, and they can still continue to contribute and let that grow until they're ready to retire. So um, that gives you kind of a comparison between DB and DC uh, as actuaries. Um, you know, if you're interested in the actuarial side of, of the wealth business, uh, we've mainly focused on, on the DB side. So Alexa is going to go a little bit more in depth and explain how that works. Thanks, Danny. Uh, so diving more into defined benefit plans. Um, so this is a very large focus of Mercer um, and a very big source of our revenue. Uh, so we, there are many different ways that we can service a defined benefit plan for our clients. And so, so there's four areas there and we might be doing one up to all of these um, for our clients. Uh, so retirement consulting is what I'm going to focus on more today and I'll get into that further um, in the next slides. Uh, but just to touch on these other areas quickly. Uh, so risk is another area that plan sponsors are very concerned about these days. Um, at Mercer, we have a financial strategy group um, that specifically works on this area of defined benefit plans. Um, so they do some pretty cool things. Um, one thing is an asset liability modeling study. Uh, so plan sponsors really want their assets that they have set aside to pay these benefits and their liabilities to move together in the same direction. Um, and Mercer is able to help them with this. And another area is administration. Um, so we have a group at Mercer that is able to perform benefit calculations for employees as they retire. Um, we have a call center that's able to take all these calls if a client so chooses to outsource all of their administration to Mercer. Um, a lot of clients are still doing this in-house though. Um, one other area is investments, um, which we'll also get into later today. Um, but that assets that are set aside um, for the pension plan, we are also able to give advice to clients on. Can move on. Uh, so diving more into the retirement consulting, um, these are some of the main areas that we do, and this is what we'll call recurring work. Uh, so these are things that we do on an annual basis for our clients um, very frequently. So at the heart of what a pension actuary does is perform actuarial valuations. Uh, so we perform a funding valuation and an accounting valuation. Uh, in the funding valuation, the main goal there is to, by following the IRS laws, is determine what the minimum required contribution that a plan sponsor must put into the plan each year. Um, the IRS rules are, there are so many of them, they're very abundant and they are very tricky. Um, so this is one area of focus for pension actuaries. Uh, in the accounting valuation, this is where we determine the expense values and then also the funded status of the plan. Um, this gets reported on the balance sheet and the income statement uh, for a client. Another thing that we do is calculate the PBGC premiums. So that stands for Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Uh, one way to think of this is kind of like a tax or an insurance on your pension plan. Um, so there are specified amounts that you have to pay to the PBGC based on the funded status of the plan and also how many participants are there. Um, these PBGC premiums are pretty hefty. Um, and this is also a reason we'll get into later um, on why a lot of clients are trying to at least downsize their plans so that they are not paying uh, the large amounts of this tax to the PBGC. Um, one other area that we do um, is perform benefit calculations. So as I mentioned, we do have that outsourcing group if um, the administration group that would perform these, um, but also uh, the actuaries do tend to help out with these um, if a client needs or if they're like a little bit tricky, I would say. Um, so that if a person is going to retire, uh, we can calculate the benefits so that they can be put into payment. Um, and benefit calculations are also the heart of the actuarial evaluation that we'll get into more. Uh, so diving deeper into benefit calculations, um, as I had mentioned, these are really the heart of our career. Um, this is at the very beginning, this is a very good tool so that you can start to really understand pension plans. Uh, so each plan is going to have a pretty large plan document um, that goes through all the rules for that plan. Um, so each plan is going to have a different formula. 
uh, maybe the benefit is based on a dollar multiplier times the years of service, um, or it could be on the final average pay. So maybe the last three years of pay are taken into account in the calculation. Uh, these are going to be very different um, for each client. So these benefit calculations, as I mentioned, are performed uh, to have participants start receiving their payment, um, but also when we perform valuations, in order to determine that liability, we also need to start with what is the participant's benefit or what do we think that benefit is going to be. Uh, so diving more into that actuarial valuation that I keep bringing up. Um, so it can be confusing, but really at the heart of it, all it is is we're trying to calculate the benefits that we think employees are going to be paid. And then we add on to that the expenses that are going to be paid by the plan. Uh, so this could be actuarial fees, uh, legal fees, and then subtracted off of that is the investment earnings. So that pool of assets that's set aside to eventually pay those benefits Earns, asset, earns investment earnings through the years, and then this can ultimately be subtracted off of that ultimate cost for the plan sponsor. So once we can determine what we think that ultimate cost is, we break that up into segments uh, so that an employer recognizes a portion of that each year. In order to do that, we don't know at the end goal what exactly is that cost going to be because there are many things that can happen throughout the years. Uh, but we use the past experience of the plan or using standard assumptions to determine what our best estimate of that is. Uh, so we have this little guy here at the bottom of the screen. Um, so he can take many paths throughout the years. Once he starts working in a company, let's say he quits in 10 years. So we think his benefit is only going to be $3,500. However, he could work there the whole way up until his retirement and retire at age 65. His benefit is going to be much higher than because of the higher amount of service he has accrued over the years. Uh, so through the actuarial valuation, we have different decre decrements and assumptions on how likely we think each of these scenarios is to occur. And so this is actually a slide that we present to our clients uh, very often, but I thought it might be helpful for you to understand what a pension actuary and a plan sponsor is really thinking about. Uh, so if we look at that bottom left-hand chart there, uh, so the red line there is the S&P 1500, or we can think of this as the equities that the assets are likely to be invested in, or at least a portion of them. Uh, so we, it's been very volatile over the years, and especially with COVID there at the beginning of the year, you can see that large drop in equities. Um, so that was a bit of a low point um, for pension plan sponsors during this year. Uh, that blue line there is bond yields. Uh, so ultimately, that liability that we come up with in, in the actuarial valuation um, is discounted to today uh, using an interest rate that is based on bond yields. Uh, so that's what that blue line represents. Um, and through this year, we've seen massive drops in bond yields. And as this decreases, the liability increases, which is not a good scenario for plan sponsors. On the right-hand side there, uh, this shows the funded status of all of the companies that make up the S&P 1500 that have pension plans. Uh, so you can see during this year, um, it's dropped quite a bit. Um, so overall, a 4% decrease uh, in funded status and ultimately plan sponsors are trying to get, they want this to increase so that they can terminate the plan or at least downsize the plan. Um, and on here, it also does mention that PBGC tax I had brought up earlier. Um, so depending on how underfunded your plan is, you could be paying up to $644 per person in your plan per year to the PBGC, um, which is uh, quite a bit for some plan sponsors. And then just touching on some of the special projects uh, that we do for clients, there is quite a bit more, um, but this is a big area of our focus. Um, so as I had mentioned, uh, plan sponsors ultimately want to decrease the size of their plan. Um, many are not able to fully terminate their plan due to the funded status. Um, they would have to contribute large amounts of cash that they are unable to do. Um, so more likely they're going to perform these other actions that just downsize the plan. Um, so that could be an annuity buyout, uh, which is transferring some of your current retirees to an insurance company. Uh, so you completely take them off of your books. Um, you pay a little bit of a premium sometimes to the insurance company for this, um, but it does drastically downsize 
to your plan and also you're not paying those PBGC premiums anymore. Um, another one to mention is a lump sum cash out. Um, so this can be given to terminate invested employees. So these are employees that are no longer working for your company, um, but have not yet started their benefit. Um, so they can be given a one-time payment of their benefit. Um, this is pretty beneficial for some employees um, because then they can roll this over into something where it is earning interest um, because in a pension plan, it is just sitting there at this point. And then also these are able to be given to actives over 62. Um, this is actually a recent law change. It used to be, a, the age used to be higher. Um, but this is also very beneficial for active employees since it's no longer earning interest. Um, and during these hard times right now for some people, it is nice that they are able to pull this money out. And I'll turn it over to David. All right, um, before I dive into defined contribution um, plans and what we do at Mercer around defined contribution, I wanted to check with William, do we have any questions in the chat, um, either as they relate to defined benefit plans for Alexa or the high level kind of difference between defined benefit and defined contribution plans for Danny? We have not received any questions in the chat thus far, David, but I do want to give the students an opportunity to take themselves off of mute and verbally ask a question. So does anyone have any questions as it relates to any of the material that's been covered so far? We'd love to hear from you. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. Um, Alexa, I know you talked about like their each um, benefit uh, calculation is different with a different formula. So I guess how exactly do you like, are those formulas made for each different um, client? Um, so those pension plan documents um, are, normally these plans have started quite a while ago. Um, so these documents were drafted quite a while ago um, and legal would be involved as well um, in order to determine what is a fair benefit formula. Um, and then over the years, there's, there can be different changes to these. Um, so we call those pension plan amendments um, and legal would also be involved in that process and we would receive those and then update our valuation if necessary. Thank you. I'll chime in quickly on that one too. Um, so usually when a plan is first to trying to design or when a company is trying to design their pension plan, they have a certain cost in mind, how much money they want to put towards their pension plan and with a certain amount of benefit that they want their employees to receive. So that's something that the actuary helps them figure out is how can we de design a plan with a certain formula that's going to cost the company X amount of dollars per year or X percent of the total payroll budget and be able to do so in a way that it's going to provide a, a certain amount of benefit for the employees too. So those are a couple of different factors that we have to balance when we're thinking about designing a plan. And, you know, even though a lot of these pension plans were designed, you know, decades ago, sometimes they'll go through a, a plan redesign where they want to change the benefit or change how the benefits are administered. So we might help them come up with something else that lowers their cost and still tries to provide a good benefit to the employees. Hey, thank you. And do, do these, uh, can, is, I guess, how frequently do they change the benefits? Um, is it like a long-term thing or is it like every year they're kind of trying to um, find different ways? Definitely wouldn't be every year. Um, this is, you know, maybe after a couple of decades have gone by and they've seen that with this certain design that they have in place, their contributions are going up, the plan's getting more expensive. So then they want to find a way to either de-risk or redesign the plan so that it can be a little bit more cost effective. So it, it might be, you know, 10 or 20 years down the road or, or never at all if they decide that they like the plan that they have in place already. Thank you. All right, any other questions before I dive into the defined contribution plan? Hearing none, but uh, you know, feel free to add questions to the chat as we go along. Happy to address those as, as uh, I go through these slides or at the end if you prefer. All right, so you got the 
brief introduction of what a defined contribution plan is. And again, I just wanted to reiterate, you might've heard of 401k plan. That's kind of the most common example of a corporate defined contribution plan. There's also things such as 403Bs and then there's defined contribution plans for executive 57 BRF. Um, but for purposes of today's discussion, I'm gonna highlight a couple of different um, project types that you might get exposure to um, as a newer defined contribution analyst at Mercer. Um, so the first and one of my personal favorites is vendor management. Um, and I'll get into some more details about the benchmarking or RFI projects. And, um, whoa, I don't know how that just happened. Oh. All right, well, I will go with the PowerPoint version then. That's weird. Sorry, are you seeing the red on my screen? All right, so bear with me one second. I have no idea how that happened. I think that might have gotten uh, drawn on through Zoom. All right, I'm gonna pull this up on my other screen. All right, can you guys see the report? Looks good now. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you see it? Yeah, it looks good now. Okay, sweet, awesome, sorry about that. Okay, so vendor management, I'll get into a little bit more detail, but some of the uh, topic or specific projects I'm gonna be discussing are fee benchmarking or RFIs, um, which stands for Request for Information, or Request for Proposals or RFPs, um, specifically as they relate to defined contribution record keeping vendors, which I will provide a more detailed overview in a, in a second. I'll also get into some compliance work. So you might've heard of non-discrimination testing. I'll go through a couple examples of that. Um, and then also some defined contribution analytics. So whether that be benchmarking your plan provisions or um, plan design costing. So playing around with your formulas to you know, get, get the right fit for your employer. Um, all right, so vendor management. Here's a list of a bunch of different types of projects you might see. Um, as I stated before, I'm gonna focus on uh, the request for information or fee benchmarking, as well as the request for proposal um, or RFP. So let me take a step back. Who are vendors? What is vendor management? Uh, what, what am I talking about right now? So you might recognize some of these companies. Some of them are investment companies like a Fidelity, some of them are historically insurance companies like uh, an Empower or Avoya. Um, some of them are banks like Wells Fargo. Um, the point is all of these companies offer defined contribution record keeping services. We call them vendors in the defined contribution space. And the reason why is they're responsible for plan administration. So a 401k plan, um, you know, you'll sign up for your 401k plan. You'll say, hey, I want to defer like 10% of my salary or whatever it is into your 401k plan. Your employer's gonna put the money in there too. You're gonna direct the investments, but you know, there's gotta be some organization that actually invests it for you. If you need some kind of transaction, whether that be a withdrawal or a loan against your 401k, they're the ones who are um, facilitating that. And they're, they're really the plan administrators. They offer education services to participants so that they understand what benefits are available to them. They furnish uh, websites for both the participant and the plan sponsor. Um, and the plan sponsor is our client. They're the ones who are um, in, in charge of uh, the plan. And, you know, they're, they're often fiduciaries for the plan. But this would be a good idea of, you know, who are some of the companies that we're interacting with. All right. So what are we actually doing with these companies? Um, one thing that we do is we evaluate whether the fees that our clients are paying to these vendors are fair for the services being offered. So we'll get a bunch of information from um, these vendors, from the vendor that is currently the plan administrator for their plan, and um, we'll, we'll kind of create a draft document with a bunch of the information, send it to some of the other vendors and say, all right, if you were to uh, win the business for our client, how much would you charge based on the information that we're able to provide? And uh, we'll then kind of compare that to the current fees being paid to see, all right, are your fees in line? Are you paying way too much? And this is something that's really important because 
recently the landscape has changed such that um, many companies are getting sued because their participants are paying like what is deemed excessive fees in their retirement plan. So this is definitely something that we're seeing a lot of in this space. Um, projects that you know you can get experience as, as a newer defined contribution analyst. Um, and the difference between that that request for information or fee benchmarking and a request for proposal is that in a request for proposal we're not just focused on the fees we're focused on the fees and the services so we're and we're actually going to market and we're saying you know instead of just tell us what you would uh charge for to administer these plans um we're actually considering moving to a new vendor um or our client is and you know should you be awarded the services what bit or what fee quotes can we lock in um so we typically do fee benchmarking or RFI projects every two to three years while we do RFPs or um, we also call them vendor searches every four to six years. Um, they're pretty big projects. We, we end up creating a big report for our clients um, that helps them meet their fiduciary obligation and documents, you know, why they either stayed with their vendor or moved to another vendor and documents that their, their fees are competitive. So, Another type of project is compliance projects. Um, you know, we, we do things like we do audits, we do um, trainings from a compliance perspective, we do document reviews. So whether that's a fee policy statement or investment policy statement or committee charter, these are all documents that really help our clients, you know, say what they're gonna do and help them stick to a plan that uh, shows that they're, you know, doing their obligation, they're, they're performing in the best interest of participants and, um, you know, Help, helping take uh, their, their fiduciary responsibility and um, documenting to outside companies, whether that be an audit or the IRS, they're, they're doing everything that they should be doing. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about non-discrimination testing. Um, the ones on the left are the names. I've provided a little bit of details of what these tests are that we perform. So the first two kind of go together, the 402G and the 415C. These are limit tests that we can perform. Um, so, for example, you may or may not know that there is a limit to the amount of money that you can put into a retirement plan every year. Um, there's also a limit of the total amount that can go into a retirement plan every year, which is your money, the employee's money, combined with the employer's money. So, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that our clients don't have participants that are deferring more than the limits, and if they do, they'll have to issue some kind of refund. Um, there's also the actual deferral percentage test and the actual contribution percentage test. You might have heard of ADP and ACP testing. Essentially what these tests boil down to is um, making sure that highly compensated employees or participants making over a certain threshold in the plan aren't receiving benefits that are proportionally more than everyone else in the plan. So um, part of why this is called non-discrimination testing is it's trying to create that level playing field that you're not rewarding the top um, like earners in your company unfairly as compared to uh, everyone else. So, um, you know, I, I've seen one example of we had a client that had like seven different plans that roll up into one entity and all the plans had different um, plan provisions and different rules. And, you know, pe uh, people were transferring between one plan to the other based on where they worked. And um, that's kind of where we come in. Sometimes we'll get these kind of complex plans that we need to make sure that they're following all of these rules. All right, and then the last type of project that I'm gonna to touch on real quick is DT analytics. Um, so specifically benchmarking and plan design costing. Um, so, so benchmarking, an example of that is, you know, we'll, we'll go through um, and similar to what Alexa was talking about with defined benefit plans, how they have a plan document, defined contribution plans do as well. So we'll go through the plan document and the associated amendments and we'll kind of document, here's where your plan is to our client. You know, here's what the eligibility provisions are. You know, some plans might not allow participants to enter until they're 21 years old. Um, some of them might need a year of service to participate. We'll go through, you know, what kind of contributions does your plan offer? Do you have a matching contribution? What is your matching contribution? Is it in line with your peers? We have survey data and other things that we can use to make sure that we're um, benchmarking and showing our clients where there might be an opportunity to improve and get more in line with market. Um, and then the other type of project, which I'll get into a little bit more on the next slide, is plan design. So um, one example that I find really interesting is uh, when I was starting at Mercer, Mercer was kind of 
transitioning from, um, they were freezing their defined benefit plan and changing the benefits that were offered in the 401k plan to enhance those to kind of offset for what participants might be um, missing out on um, not having a defined benefit plan anymore. So um, Mercer ended up changing their structure and now we offer a 50% on 6%. So meaning if I defer um, 6% or more of my salary into my 401k, Mercer will or match half of that. So effectively 3%. And then they'll also just give you another 4%. So you could essentially be getting another 7% from um, Mercer if you're deferring six or more percent. So it's a nice benefit to know about, but uh, the point of me bringing all this up is that, um, you know, there, there was a lot of analytics involved in coming to that decision. So there, there were um, defined contribution analysts who were working on that to figure out, all right, what makes sense, you know, based on the amount of benefits that we, we want to offer our participants to make sure that they're ready for retirement, you know, what, what's a good formula that we can come up with. So that's, that's a fun project that I work on. You know, it has to take into account things like not costing the employer too much, making sure your participants are ready for retirement. Um, are you competitive across your peers and other things like that? Um, so yeah, I know that was very quick. Happy to take some questions at the end, but those are some of the defined contribution projects that I've worked on and that you might experience in your first couple of years on Mercer. All right, and Jim's going to talk about the investments now. Sure, and just start starting on page 2027, 20, and this is a pretty generic slide that we send to a number of prospective clients, but I think it kind of does a good job of separating the two sides of investment consulting. And really, I mean, what this slide is focusing on is the client side. So as you can see, Mercer, largest consultant by assets under management, assets under advisement, so what does that necessarily mean? That means that we're being hired by a number of large institutional investors. So think about the DB plans that have been mentioned earlier, the defined contribution plans. I work on an endowments foundations. Um, and I mean, there's a number of other ones such as insurance and healthcare as well. But so, I mean, this really focuses on, on the client side of it. And as you can see, Mercer largest significantly in the non-discretionary space, which would be the right side. And then on the left side is the discretionary space. And what I mean by that is Mercer has the ability to act without the client's consent in investment related transactions. So they can make the decision to hire a manager, fire a manager, um, switch up the asset allocation. Um, and I'll move to the next slide. So, and then the second side of the business would be research. So while you have a whole side of investment consulting worried about the client, there's a second side. And so we have a number of individuals throughout the country and throughout the world where they're constantly meeting with asset managers. So hedge funds, equity mutual funds, um, fixed income funds. And what they're doing there is they're really trying to get an idea of who, who is the best within each space, um, how managers interact with one another, and so that's kind of the second, that would be the second half of the consulting business. And so if you go to the next slide, and, and I'm talking about consulting, and the way, the way I like to think about it is being a portfolio manager at a macro level. So you're not necessarily saying, go, go invest $500,000 in Apple or, um, or buy this bond. But what you're doing is you're working with the client, you're saying, I think you should have X amount in stock, X amount in bonds. And then after that, you go to, you begin to work with manager research and you determine what managers you should have within the portfolio, how much to each manager, should you be allocating to a liquid strategies? And that's kind of the investment structure process that you see at the bottom. Um, and then the last, I mean, the last, kind of step in all of this, and it's probably the most mundane is performance reporting. Um, and just communicating the results of the portfolio of the managers, if there's any issues, just kind of keeping the client aware of that. So going to the next slide, and I, I talked about setting investment objectives. So all of you are in school right now, all of you, all of your schools have an endowment. That endowment for the most part is going to have a long term investment objective of um, perpetual growth, meaning every year or over the long term, the portfolio wants to gain 
in excess of its spending rate and inflation. And I just put 4% and 2% here. I mean, you could see some institutions with spending rates in the eight to 10% range and inflation, I mean, for the last 15 years, it's kind of been in that one and a half to two and a half percent range, but that's kind of how you come up with uh, the long-term return objective for the portfolio. And why that's important is it really helps you just, it really helps you decide what asset classes are more, most appropriate. How should the portfolio be structured? Let's say, let's say that you had, um, let's say you had a lower spending rate, but you needed more liquidity for maybe a long-term need. You're probably going to position the portfolio more conservatively, have more in cash, have more in bonds. Um, and so I'll move to the next slide. And, and this kind of just reiterates a point made a couple slides earlier. So as a consultant, there's really kind of five ways where you're adding value. The strategic asset allocation, the dynamic asset allocation, I kind of bundle those together as uh, just kind of asset allocation. So you're working with your clients on that. The dynamic side of it, that's taking into account what's going on in the news. So for example, I think a good example is during COVID, um, we expected small businesses to be hurt worse than larger businesses, right? So within a portfolio, you may wanna say, okay, I have a dedicated allocation to large cap equity. I have a dedicated allocation to small cap equity. Maybe I can make some sort of tactical overweight to large cap to just position it a little bit better and add a little bit of value relative, um, relative to your goals. And, and manager selection, that's something we talked on before. Um, really just identifying those best opportunities. And it's not even, it's not even necessarily the managers who've done the best, but maybe it's the managers who interact with one another the best. So, um, and I'm gonna to touch on that in a couple of slides. So I think we can kind of, we can go to the next one. And so I was talking about strategic al asset allocation earlier. This is just a very abridged example of what we're doing. Um, so we established target weights to the individual asset classes. So you'll see US equity, there's the large cap target I mentioned, small cap, developed international. And each one of these underlying asset classes has expected return and risk assumptions. And the idea is based off the, based off the client's objectives, you're gonna to wanna to position the portfolio to capture the most um, return possible with the least amount of risk possible. And then that you'll, you'll see the expected return, 6.1%. We're kind of designing this portfolio with the, uh, with the hopes that it'll at least, at least return 6% a year or be expected to return 6% over the long term. And just the last thing I'd also point out to this slide is you'll notice not only do we have target allocations to each of the individual asset classes, but you have these allowable ranges on the right side. And what that really does is it sets us up if U.S. large cap does phenomenally well and all of a sudden it's 43, having that allowable range there tells us, okay, you're past 41% immediately rebalance back. So have your portfolio in line with what you communicated to your clients. So going to the next slide. I, I touch on this briefly, but this kind of just comes into the, this is kind of just an example of dynamic asset allocation. And this is at the most macro level possible. So we're looking at equities, growth fixed income, which would be your high yield, which would be private debt, defensive fixed income, which is more along the lines of um, US government bonds, mortgage backed securities and cash. But this goes all the way down to, um, I mean, it really gets micro in terms of, okay, maybe we're recommending being overweight to US equities instead of developed international, or maybe within defensive fixed income where we like, we like the yield pickup you get for mortgage back relative to, um, relative to US Treasury. So going overweight one and underweight the other. So if you go to the next slide, so this would be where the manager selection comes into play. And I've, on the, on the left-hand side, you'll see the strategy type I've removed the actual managers, but, and, and that's just um, 
for client confidentiality. But this is kind of where you could see it all come together. And this is, this is only that client's equity portfolio. So you can see that the client overweight, overweight to US large cap and then underweight to US small cap. And that, and that was an intentional decision. That was, that was driven by the fact that, um, like I said earlier, that we thought US large cap companies were better positioned to weather, to weather um, economic slowdown related to COVID. Um, but then you'll also notice within US large cap, we've got the passive option. That's something to consider whenever you're a, a setting up a manager por or an equity portfolio or any asset class portfolio. Then you have active large cap value, active large cap growth. And the idea is that these two managers will complement each other in a way that one manager is gonna outperform in up market scenarios, maybe the other one outperforms when the market's down. And so moving to the right-hand side of the page, you'll see that. You'll see up market capture, down market capture, sharp ratio, which I'm sure, um, which I'm sure anyone in any sort of finance class has seen before. Um, but that, that, I mean, that at a high level, that really kind of touches on, on the investment consulting side. And I'll, I'll pause for questions there if, if there are any. And if anyone likes to take themselves off a of mute and ask your question verbally, we would love to hear from you. All right. Otherwise, I think I'm handing it back to David. Tips for success. All right. Thanks, Jim. Yep. Just to leave you with, we had a couple of tips for success. Um, not going to read every word, but a couple things that you know we came up with was be a problem solver gain expertise, you know, whatever it is you decide to do, whether it's defining benefit, define contribution, investments, or maybe all three, uh, figure, figure out what you want to be an expert in, um, refine your skills, you know, I'll say project management comes up pretty big in just about every client or um, every, every project that I've worked on requires project management. Um, show interest and enthusiasm. Um, a, a lot of our new hires come in with so much like eagerness to learn and that's, that's awesome. We love that. Um, and ask questions. So directly related to that last one. If you have any questions on anything that um, we've touched on today, whether it be defined benefit, defined contribution, investments, or questions about our background, um, feel free to ask. David, it looks like we did receive one question in the chat here. Uh, Kyle is asking, how often do companies switch vendors? Good question. So, you know, it, in, not, not the best answer, but it, it really depends on that company and it depends on kind of who the vendor is. So the example I'll give is that, you know, this year Vanguard's going through a big change where they're offshoring a lot of their um, record keeping um, to India. And because of the change and because of the, the, the new company that they brought in, there's, you know, a, a lot of our clients are thinking about doing a, a defined contribution record keeping search. Um, I'd say most of the ones that I do, maybe about 75% will end up staying with their same vendor because it is a process to kind of switch and go through the implementation. And, you know, it, it is a lot of work on the client side, but, um, you know, sometimes it's not broken. They're just doing their due diligence. They're seeing, can we negotiate a better fee or fix whatever problems we might have, address those pain points um, and enhance the relationship. Um, but I'd say 25% of them switch and of those that switch, Half of them know that, you know, I'm going into this knowing that I'm switching because something's very broken or the relationship is damaged. And the other half were just very impressed by, you know, one of the bidders that came out of left field and they loved the services. They loved their website. They loved that the fees were much lower than what they were paying today. So, um, you know, we recommend doing them every four to six years. And I, I'd say about 25% of them end up switching. Great question, Kyle. Thanks for that. Well, it looks like we are um, running out of time here, getting close to the top of the hour. So, you know, I do want to give the students one last opportunity to ask a question here. Again, we do have the chat open. Um, you know, we, we definitely want to hear from you if, if you have questions. That's really one of the main goals here is to educate you on what we do and to make sure that um, you, you're pretty aware of how the business works and some of the involvement that, that uh, our colleagues do. Okay. Um, 
Did you? Yeah, so I have a quick question just about um, in general, like how do you guys, I guess with investments, DB and DC, like how do you guys kind of interact and work together or is it um, you guys are all separate or something like that? I can take that one because I do define benefit, define contribution and investment work and I have clients in all three spaces. So um, defined contribution and investments largely works hand in hand. A lot of times, for example, if you choose a new record keeper, the next thing that they'll look at is redoing the fund lineup in there or if it's a new client, you know, because the participants are the ones picking their investment options, like when in a defined contribution plan, um, a lot of times defined contribution consultant will work directly with an investment consultant, especially like um, with larger clients, because um, they really do need both of those services and they require experts on both retirement and investments. Um, defined benefit, I find to be a little bit more siloed. Um, they, they might, you know, work with investments, but in sometimes, you know, a defined benefit uh, consultant will go to a meeting and they'll hear something like, you know, something's not working in my defined contribution plan uh, and they'll bring in that defined contribution consultant, but um, that's not quite as frequent as maybe a defined contribution consultant working with an investment consultant. Um, does anyone have anything else to add or maybe a different opinion based on their experience? I think that's accurate. The one thing I would add, just to give you an example, I have a client that a few years ago decided wanted to go on a journey plan to eventually terminate their pension plan and completely move over to, they have another either cash balance plan or a defined contribution plan that they could put their employees in. But basically what that looked like is teaming with our investments consultants, putting in a plan saying that as the plan's assets improve and they're in comparison to their liabilities, as that funded status improves, let's continue to move those investments from equities to fixed incomes to reduce the risk of losses there and kind of lock in those high funded status percentages so that um, as we're making contributions, the assets will go up and stay there. And then we have enough money to eventually pay an insurance company to come in and, and take on paying the annuities and paying the future benefits for those employees so that they could eventually terminate that plan. So now we're getting closer to that point where they're actually gonna terminate. But you know that was a, a process that took a few years in the making that we continually worked with the investments consultants on. Thank you. And actually, one other quick note you made me think of: um, sometimes oh, defined benefit actuaries work with uh, the health team. Like for example, if you're doing an OPEB um, plan, which is like you know the post-retirement uh, or life insurance type plans, we'll work with the uh, health actuaries to get claims costs and make sure that the experience that is currently happening and, you know, for people who are making claims for their medical benefits or life insurance benefits is uh, resembling our assumptions. Great dialogue, guys. Well, it looks like we are at the end of time. Again, I wanted to personally thank everyone for taking the time to join today's conversation. Um, I'm sure the students found a lot of value in the material that was shared. Uh, sometimes we do get questions after the call. So in the event that happens, uh, we'll definitely reach out to get uh, further information.